Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Disciples of Bone and Shadow, which is a solo focused RPG that uses a combination of D20 mechanics and D100 mechanics. And hopefully there's a lot to loot here, especially if you're running an OSR type game, even if you're not running a solo game, there should be plenty of material here for us to steal if we're running a hex crawl or any sort of open world style campaign. Uh, this is the rather deluxe slipcase hardback edition of it. I'm not sure if these are still available. It may have just been for a Kickstarter or something similar. However, uh, when I checked, there was still um, some softback versions available. And of course there was a PDF um, there is also a free version of the PDF that's a shortened version of this. This whole book is uh, about 250 pages, but I think there's an abridged version that you can get uh, for free. Really nice design. It has this kind of faux leather cover, uh, a lot of gold stamping, Disciples of Bone and Shadow right there. Nothing on the back, just the symbol for Black Oath, which is the publisher that puts this out. The slipcase as well, if you happen to get this version, is very nice, although it is oddly slightly too big for the book, but that's not really a big deal. What am I complaining about? Let's take a look inside and see what we get here. Some very grungy old school illustrations right inside the front cover. And this is the Concord Sun edition. That's the uh, really big deluxe version by Alex T. And this is copy 74 of 100. So I guess there wasn't very many of these made. Before we dig any deeper into this book, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by One More Quest, a comedic dexterity-based role-playing game set in the world of Dungeon Fighter, now on Kickstarter. To take an action, you roll a die as close to the center of a target as possible, but with restrictions based on the kind of action you're attempting. Need to hide from a guard? Roll from under the table. Need to distract a monster that's about to blast your party? Do a spin before throwing. Includes 24 different throw restrictions, a travel guide, monsters, ancestries, classes, weapons, and adventure, everything that you need. Check it out on Kickstarter using the link below. All right, let's see what we get inside here. So here is our table of contents right at the beginning. There's a Game Master emulator, which is really important if you're running any kind of solo game. You got loot and gear, a whole bunch of different monsters, a location or a continent that you're exploring, and some starting scenarios. Some very cool illustrations here. The construction of the book is really nice. The paper quality is great. It's this kind of you know, slightly creamy color, uh, very thick. You can't really see through it at all. Uh, this is stitch bound. There is a ribbon. Really love the way that this is put together here. So the dice are going to be the standard dice that you're going to need for uh, D and D. When you're actually creating a character here, you're going to have your basic attributes, and those are going to be rolled with 3D6 as is traditional. However, there is also a skill system on top of that that uses D100. So it reminds me a little bit of things like Rune Quest or stuff based on the basic, uh, not basic fantasy, basic role playing system that's been out for a long time and that it uses those two things. You start off with 250 points is what you can uh, spread among your skills, but no skill can start at higher than 50. Um, some skills by default start a little bit higher. So like one handed melee starts out at strength plus dex. Um, so like an average is 10, right? So it's going to start out at around 20 and then you can raise it from there. Cause I guess there's just some skills that are really important no matter who you are. And some are just gonna start at zero and you have to level those up all on your own. There's also passive skills here. You can spend some experience points to level those up later to get some special abilities. And there's some archetypes here as well. So for example, you have an acolyte, prerequisites, constitution 14, will 16, charisma 15. So these would be pretty hard to get at least initially. Um, and they give you some bonuses like max corruption is plus one. You start off with a special spell and so on. Uh, I don't know if you really need to use this stuff, um, but it's there if you want to kind of fit into an archetype. The, the general setting is very Stone Age. It's called Bone and Shadow. So you have a lot of bone weapons, stone weapons, uh, very primitive society, uh, very kind of sword and sorcery is the way, is the uh, feel that it gives to me. There's some advanced archetypes that you can fit into, much harder to get. You have character flaws. And these are mostly for flavor. So for example, absent-minded, you forget things like people's names or whether you met them before or if you fed your horse. And these can get worse and worse. 
Uh, advantages and disadvantages, something like uh, fearless. Maybe a witch told you how uh, how you would die. Maybe you've already faced death many times and come unscathed. No matter why, you've never feared death and have always faced it with a grin, not letting it stop you from achieving your goals. Advantages and you got some disadvantages. Edges, mementos, you've got some starting equipment and you got your basic core rules. It's simply a roll under system. So if your skill for hand-to-hand -hand combat is 50, then you need to roll a 50 or less on a D100 to do things. In order to attack someone, you have to roll under the appropriate skill, but you are going to subtract your opponent's uh, defense ability number from your skill to make it a little bit harder. And it can also work the other way around because everything is completely uh, player-facing, being a designed to be a solo game. So when you are under attack, what's going to happen is you're going to roll uh, underneath your defense skill, and that's going to be modified by your opponent's attack number. You have all your basic rules like critical success and failure, how to retreat, attacking a helpless target. Uh, this says if you're attacking someone helpless, you get plus 50 to the attack roll, which is pretty generous. I mean, I would go even more generous and just say that you shouldn't be rolling if you're attacking helpless characters, that you should just be killing them instantly. Um, but that is probably enough to kill most characters. You'll be, you'll be rolling uh, a standard damage die to see how much damage you do if you happen to hit them. There is morale systems, which is really great um, because that's a major part of any combat that's going to take itself seriously. You should be able to frighten people off or have them surrender once you beat them up enough. Here's our magic system, a whole bunch of different spells that we can learn, and it runs basically off of corruption. So the more spells you cast, the more corruption that you're going to gain. And if you have too much corruption at any one time, then you're basically out of play. You're turned into a zombie or you're dead or what have you. You simply can't continue as a player character. Some spell examples we might have are Enthrall. So cost uh, two experience points and corruption level, I think is what CL stands for. It's going to affect, uh, yeah, corruption level. So that's going to be how likely you are to get corrupted. Immediately persuade a target of anything, as long as it does not hurt them, something or some something someone or something that they care of. Uh, this reminds me a lot of your typical wizard ability in something like Conan the Barbarian. He's always terrified of wizards because if you look them in the eye, they will steal your soul and control your mind. So that's really great. Very Conan-esque. Orbs of light, pain transfer, unlock. Lots of good stuff. Some rules for necromancy. And for alchemy. Alchemy is a fun system. There's lots of different plants uh, here. Dwarf, yellow crest, bitterweed, way clover. And if you combine them and you make a good roll, then you might have a special effect that comes from combining those things. And this can lead to you developing recipes. So the game organically develops recipes um, just by rolling successfully. So once you figure out what a certain combination does, from now on, that's what it does. And if you write that down somewhere, now you know how to make that potion going forward. Here's some possible potion effects like poison or narcotics or increasing ability scores, all sorts of fun things like that. Exploring the world, you are going to be using a hex map to move around the world and filling things in as you go. Uh, one thing that was a little bit confusing is that there are some rules for exploring the world here, but a lot of the information that you're going to need to fill in the world is actually in a different section in the back where it covers the pre-built or pre-designed continent. It would have been nice to have everything in one place because it was a little bit confusing as I was reading this. I kept asking myself where the information was. Well, it's just, it's somewhere else. There's a number of good random tables here to use. Travel complications, you got D10 of those, landslides, battlefields that you come across, overgrowth, restless deads. Uh, you got terrain types, wetlands, plains, hills, and so on. Uh, setting camp mishaps. Plenty of good random tables to add variety as you travel around. I think my main criticism is that I would like even more of these. Um, they're mostly D10 tables. And I think if you explore enough, you're gonna start getting repeats of these. Of course, you could just you know come up with variations on that to keep them fresh. But I would have liked to see more detailed random tables. When you don't have a game master and you're trying to do everything on your own, then you're gonna need a lot of information provided to you by the game. And I think that this could have gone even further. Perhaps you could supplement it with something like uh, My Game Maze Rats, which has a lot of tables like that, or like the um, Tome of Adventure design by Frog God Games. That's a great one as well. We have a sequence for how do you do interior explorations, kind of a flow chart here. Start at the entrance, you come across a corridor or a door opening, and then you roll on the corridor table, roll on the exits table to see where you could go, 
any doors you come across, what's on the inside of that room. There's old tables for these, but like I said, they are actually in the back of the book. It would have been nice to have more um, page references to figure out exactly where these things are. Like if it had what page to turn to, that would have been really cool. Some different entrances that you could have here, different types of doors. And of course you got things like uh, corridors, you got different types of traps, artifices, uh, different effects. So you have weird tricks and traps. Uh, you got a settlement generator, some random settlement effects, some pickpocketed items if you try and steal things from people because everyone loves to do that. Human encounters, plenty of different NPCs with descriptors, genders, uh, if they're hostile, if they're neutral, what their motivations are, lots of good stuff like this. You can combine these two tables together, which is nice. So for example, their motivation could be to uh, guard, you roll something over here, uh, guard chaos. Maybe they're a servant of chaos and they want chaos to win. By combining these two, you can get interesting ideas. Some of them are a bit incoherent, but it's not a big deal. You can use a lot of free form association to figure out what they mean in your own head. Some advanced rules here, how to track provisions and starvation, weight and encumbrance. It does use gear slots, which I think is really smart because that's a really quick and easy way to track how much you are carrying. Here's a page of some cell swords or some support characters or NPCs that you can pick up to help you along. Probably gonna be smart as in a solo campaign, you are just by yourself and death can come swiftly. You're gonna want either backup characters or a whole bunch of support to help you take out tougher foes. This section is on Game Master emulation. And the main thing here is that it has an auger table that helps you decide what happens when uh, something is questionable. When you're starting your first scene, you can use a table like this to just kick you off and give you something to work with. For example, you could have uh, a location that's under assault or a player character that has just died or perhaps an encounter that has become friendly. And it just gives you a starting point. We have the actual Game Master Simulator right here. So you can use this to decide uh, how dangerous something is. You can have qualifiers, but um, no qualifier or and, right? So you want to yes and things and complications that can go on top of that whether it's a complication of the physical environment like the weather changes or an unexpected change in a relationship between people um, you have plenty of ways to keep things surprising even though you are running it for yourself a bit like those character motivation tables there's also an action and theme table that can give you more idea seeds that you can develop into adventures or into weird events that are going near on nearby that you need to react to Perhaps right, you could have something like um, carry a faction or release a, a memory or release a burden, right? So that way, if you are stuck and you just don't know where to go, you will have ideas that you can use. Missions, objectives, and rumors. This is a great way to generate quests for your character to go on. So you can have what region is it in, the type of mission it is, what it's a uh, location, wh what the actual mission is, right? To uh, transport a weapon or to protect some cargo, you'll have a great way to hand out missions to yourself by rolling on the table. You also have plenty of complications here that you can use, like an unexpected alliance is required, or there is an ambush, or the patron hired other characters without the PCs knowing so. Uh, there's rumors that you can tie into that, like a giant hole has appeared ne uh, nearby overnight and nobody heard or saw anything, just to make the missions more complicated. Uh, lots of lists of loot and gear that you could pick up or buy you wanted to equip your character along with detailed write-ups of all of these. Some of these are magic items like uh, boots of the thief it gives you more stealth and pickpockets. Uh, the user must stand on water at least once a day or the boots keep shrinking, causing enormous pain and eventually impairing movement. That's nice. Um, just because it involves the character actually interacting with the environment in order to make the magic item continue to work. Uh, let's see some other ones. You've got a horse figurine, Sacrifice five hit points to be able to travel at double speed in outdoor zones for a whole day. Sells for 4,000 jats. So not all of these have those little weird tweaks, which I like, but there's a couple of those in here. We have a commonly available gear that you can equip your guy with. Some common weapons and armor. It's your pretty standard D&D &D stuff with a more uh, primitive vibe and a whole bunch of different monsters here. Uh, the monsters overall, I did not find terribly inspiring. Uh, for the most part, they are just a stat block. I would have liked to see more um, originality in terms of the kinds of monsters that they give you. 
especially when it comes to a special abilities that they have, weird monster effects, motivations, and so on, uh, to get the players more invested in figuring out how to defeat these enemies and figuring out why they're there and what they're up to. Near the back, we have the White Teeth Peninsula, and this is all set on a planet that is tidally locked, which means that you are living in a realm of perpetual shadow because one side of the planet is facing the sun and is always burning hot, and the other side is facing away and is frozen cold. So only in this narrow strip, strip between the light and the dark are you going to find habitable zone. Uh, so the entire adventure takes place in a kind of perpetual twilight, which is a fun a uh, little twist on this kind of setting. It implies a kind of sci-fi setting as well, that perhaps humans traveled here and colonized this planet long ago, and now they've reverted back to barbarism. I like that mix of sci-fi and fantasy. Each of the main regions shown here on the White Teeth Peninsula is given a bit of a write-up later on. Um, however, there is not an actual hex map put onto this. There's a hex map in the back that you can use and you can fill it in as you go. Um, it would have been nice to have it actually on here so you could travel from one place to another. Um, but that's not the exact way that it's laid out. So we have the Everscar Highlands, for example. Great, short, punchy little write-ups. Enough information that you can imagine what's there and you can figure out the kinds of encounters you would have without going on and on because most people don't like to get into super detail on game lore. It's just, it flows right out of your head. People are going to be much more engaged with the material that they encounter and they have to deal with in the game. Each region has a D20 table that's going to give you stuff that you can find there. Uh, each one represents basically a hex or a uh, type of event that's going to be going on there for you to deal with, like a pilgrimage or a magic dead zone, a rock slide. So this is for the Everscar Highlands, whereas the Akar Strand has things like a nest or an open burial site or a pool of liquid metal. Plenty of high weirdness to go around. Makes it feel a little bit more like Dying Earth, which is quite nice. And of course, each region also has encounters that are unique to it. This section is on interior exploration. So when you're doing dungeon crawling or ruin crawling, you're going to uh, use a similar procedure to generate the rooms and the encounters that you find there. We have tables for caves, cave encounters, uh, cave and ruin ecology. So vermin, uh, common human foes, elite foes that you might run into. And at the end, we have some scenarios. Uh, the scenarios are, well, they're there, but really I think the big selling point for this is going to be the open world generation. Uh, whereas running through these kind of pre-built adventures are going to be, I think, less interesting, at least for me. I really like to see my world evolve naturally as I take it on, because that's what this book is all about. It's all about procedurally generating a world and adventure as you wander around a hex map trying to overcome monsters and getting experience points. One really nice thing is that at the back of the book, there is an extended gameplay example. And this is the sort of thing that I wish a lot more RPGs would do because you have a whole bunch of rules and examples and procedures in the first half of the book. And it's very hard to fit all of those together into your head to figure out what exactly is this game like? What is a session like? What, what am I thinking about as I play? And this actually runs you through it for a number of pages. So that is really great and more RPGs do that because it is in some ways better at teaching the game than reading all of the rules. There is a character sheet at the back of the book. It looks really complicated, but it's really not. You just have your ability scores there and your skills. That's basically it. You can write down any passive skills here. Equipment just goes here. All of these are uh, scenes that you can um, write out as you encounter them because you are writing this for yourself. And you have like twists that you can put into there and characters that you've run into story arcs that you're working on if you want to do that sort of thing. And this page is really cool. It's basically a recipe book because as you're randomly generating those potion recipes, you can write them down right here. I think that's really fun. There are some uh, graph paper and some notes that you can keep track of, right? For figuring out dungeons because the dungeons are kind of randomly generated as you explore them. And we have a hex map here you can photocopy and I suppose fill in with the different terrain types and encounters as you explore. All right, that's it for Disciples of Bone and Shadow, the Conquered Sun edition. Seems like a really great addition to someone's library, especially if you like solo role playing or if you want generative tools for making this kind of um, low fantasy sword and sorcery type world. As usual, links will be in the description below for you can pick this up in PDF or in paperback form because I don't think the hardback is still available, although who knows what will happen in the future. Before we go, though, quick shout out to some of our new patrons that have joined us on Patreon in the month of January. These patrons include Spencer Shields, Bobby Bingle, Benjamin Peters, FR, Iniquit, 
Joseph Lucas, Advik Goel, Alice Dare, Eric Hanscom, Dor Perkins Dearborn, Julian Mondoloni, Craig Chiraki Lewin, Blackbeard, John Finnegan, James Holton, Jack Sundon, Cogspace, Carl Einar Oslin Gvist, Mexiteki, Justin Toth, Esteban A. Olivares, Pshemislav Selenberger, Tom P., Christian McCallahan, Laszlo Varga, Lasagna Druid, Joe Arconi, Simone Canola, Eric Tanberg, Dan Ebert, Pierre Vochel, Samuel Tewksbury, Liam Thompson, Bodie, Daniel Bennett, Guporu, Matt Johnson, Parker Temple, Seb Jones, Nate W., Samuel Henderson, Martin Orchard, Connor Shartle, Hank, Dylan McChrystal, Nicholas Tucker, Drew, One-Eyed Man, David Grubbs, Marco Serrano, John Snow, Robert Wisbrod, Glenn the Fossa, John Mahoney, Michael Petschuk, B.L., David Whitaker, Nick, Omar Marquez, Jesse Erdman, Richard Asensio, Gabe Gamer, Eric Ackerman, Cam Grilly, Jacob Bollinger, Kevin Zhang. Thanks so much to all of our supporters on Patreon for keeping this channel going, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.